Welcome to this episode of Rattling the Bars. Today we're going to talk about the 13th Amendment and the effort in California to remove the slavery portion of that. So joining me today is two organizers and activists who has been working in California to change that. Uh, John Cannon and Geronimo Aguilar. Thanks for joining me, John and Geronimo. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you to have us here. It's an honor to have. So let's let's start off, Geronimo. Let's start off with you. Talk a little bit about your work, uh, your past history, uh, and uh, where we are today. And then I'll I'll go to John in a minute. Yes, sir. So uh, I'm a Chicano from uh, Northern California. I grew up in the in the Bay Area. Um, my parents are both social workers. Um, and so I grew up around, you know, people, uh, you know, kind of cycling through the criminal justice system, trying to get their, their lives straight. And so uh, I also have a lot of a family that was involved in, in activism and the Chicano movement and the civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s. And so, uh, you know, with that education, uh, I was always taught about, you know, my rights and, and kind of, you know, our role in, in making sure that, you know, we're, we're always uh, reaching towards liberation. Um, and so uh, growing up, uh, I moved out here actually into the rural Yolo County, which is a rural area here in Northern California in the middle of kind of Sacramento and the Bay Area. Um, and so uh, I got involved once I started going to school, getting myself educated, um, you know, after various, you know, run-ins with the law here in the rural area, the cops are you know, everybody knows each other. And so for good and for bad, uh, the police, you know, uh, definitely, you know, have their eyes on you. And so uh, was definitely, you know, profiled and, and, and followed me and my brothers. And so uh, after catching, you know, cases as a juvenile uh, for various things and, and defending myself even against a lot of kind of rural racism that goes on out here, um, I decided to educate myself and go to school, uh, majored in Chicano studies at Sacramento State. Um, and uh, got involved with the Brown Berets. And so as a Brown Beret activist, uh, I started a chapter at Sacramento State and got involved in a statewide coalition. Um, and uh, after that, you know, uh, again, <laughs> the, the law enforcement in, in Sacramento had, the, had their eyes on me. I, I was involved in some high profile uh, kind of events or, or, you know, movements. I was able to spend some time out in Standing Rock when they were fighting the pipeline out there and various other movements. And, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, with that surveillance, uh, you know, again, I had, you know, cops, you know, following me and coming to my house and those type of things. Um, and so it was right around that time that, you know, for the sake of my my children, I got two little ones. I decided to uh, get involved with All of Us or None and Legal Services for Prisoners with Children. They had a, 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 pol a policy fellowship actually opening. Uh, the Elder Freeman Policy Fellowship. Elder Freeman is a, a Black Panther, um, and so I thought, wow, as a Brown Beret, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, was currently fighting the case uh, against Sacramento Police, uh, the Sacramento Police Department, and so no, none of these nonprofits would really, you know, look to hire me because of, you know, uh, kind of like my my re my record and also my involvement with with what they called radical activism. Um, but uh, Dorsey Nunn over at LSPC. I was very gracious and he gave me the opportunity to, to learn the policy side of things, uh, to be able to learn how, you know, laws, you know, bills get made into law and, and, and really just uh, a rigorous fellowship, you know, learning, uh, you know, how things go, go down at the Capitol and how we can educate our community on the grassroots level. And so I've been here with LSPC uh, since about February. Um, and so it's been a great experience getting to know um, the staff. Um, I've, I've known about the organization for, for many years. Um, and all of us are none, um, you know, also as, as kind of like our community organizing arm where we're able to, you know, uh, just be in the community and, and talk with folks and, and, and educate and, and learn from people as well. And so uh, it's been a great experience. It's been a blessing. Uh, and OK, John, yes, uh, Ger Geronimo, let's stop right there. Let's stop right there. That's good because that gives us some background. 
John, talk a little bit about yourself. You've been inside. Yeah. And been... how, how have that impacted your sisters, your brothers, your family, et cetera? Uh, talk a little bit about yourself for a minute there. Right. So I, I also grew up in the um, Northern California. I grew up in the Bay Area, Richmond and Oakland area. Live in Oakland now. Um, even being young, I was uh, impacted by the by this prison industrial complex, by this system. Uh, my, my mom was incarcerated um, most of my life until she passed. Uh, my father was incarcerated, both my older brothers. And um, I was 16 years old when I caught a case and they certified me as an adult, sent me to prison at 16. Um, so I was like about a sophomore in high school. It's, it's affected my life a lot. So I know, I know the ins and outs of the system. And, you know, I wasn't really, um, I wasn't really hip to a lot of things until I went to prison and got under some, some older, older fellas that taught me things. They put me up under some books, you know? So once I started seeing the injustices that how, how bigger the issue was just like it lit a fire inside of me. So Right now, I'm just, you know, I'm a student. I'm a student of it, and I'm just trying to make a change however I can. Just like uh, Geronimo, um, well, I was released uh, from prison in November last year, and I got the opportunity to become an um, Elder Freeman Policy Fellow. Um, met Dorsey Nunn. He, you know, he, he's, it's a big thing for him to um, enable us to speak in our own voices. You know, we're doing work for people that are incarcerated, formerly incarcerated. And that's one of the big things he says. He's like, man, you have a space here. This is your space. You know, you need to speak in your own voice. So at first, you know, I was, was a little nervous because, you know, I wasn't, you know, I'm not too educated school wise, but I was educated in uh, prison. So, but you know, okay, he, yeah, yeah. Let's stop right there because, yeah, uh, education comes in all different kind of forms, you know. Um, uh, let's 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 uh, Geronimo talk for a minute about the Thirteenth Amendment. We know kind of what it means. Why are you challenging it? Why why is this happening in California? Yes, sir. And so, uh, you know, I think that, you know, a big part of it is that, you know, what we're taught in school and, you know, is that slavery was was ended. Emancipation happened and, and slavery was a thing of the past. Right. And, and to the effect that they even say, forget about it and move on. Slavery was was done away with. And so as somebody with indigenous, you know, heritage, somebody that understands, you know, the weight of, of slavery, especially here in California uh, with indigenous people. Um, it's something that hits home, you know, for me. And so knowing that uh, that exception exists, the exception that, you know, slavery is, is you know, prohibited except for a punishment of a crime, um, you know, and, and knowing that I got so many family and friends and, and people still in there uh, being worked for, you know, $8 or, or $4 or, you know, you name it, just, just very inhumane wages, um, you know, that really, again, also like John, it, it lit a fire under me to, to really get involved with, uh, the efforts in California uh, to to amend our constitution. Okay, uh, John, just from from inside, how was it? I mean, obviously, you grew you grew into an adult. You know, I mean, uh, uh, they put you in an adult prison. Obviously, um, how was that for you as a juvenile and and like you say having family members incarcerated and and not really having outside support how was it for you inside and it was uh it was it was pretty crazy especially being so young you know I was the youngest person on the yard and then even in terms as the 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 13th amendment how the involuntary servitude was it was like you feel it firsthand you know the first thing we did when we got off the bus they take us off shackles like, you know, they strip you naked in front of everybody. And right after that, they send us to a room and give us a job. You know, and at the time, too, I was I was kind of excited about a job because I didn't have any money. Nobody was sending me money. So, you know, I, I just remember feeling like it was like an auction block, you know, 
how they got you naked, then they put you on a job. And I, there was a, a OG that told me, you know, I'm like, man, well, I'm about to get paid. He's like, you don't get paid for working in here. I'm like, what? He's like, you about to be slaving on that yard labor crew. They put me on yard labor. So, you know me, I was young. I'm like, well, if I'm not getting paid, I'm not working. And he was like, man, don't work like that. He's like, you a number now. You belong to the state. He's like, you know, so I, I, I seen it. You know, if you don't work in there, you know, it's all type of consequences. So, you know, you're forced into it. Then you don't you don't get paid at all. And I did all type of jobs from yard labor to kitchen work to warehouse work. And then eventually I was let on a fire crew, which is really dangerous work and hard work. And, and you know, you're working with firefighters that's from the outside and they getting paid more in an hour than you get paid in a whole month. So it's like really degrading. You know, you just you just feel the effects of it. And just even being in prison at that young age, it's just, you know, it was pretty crazy. Right? Grew up okay. In and I guess I'm throwing this back to you, Geronimo. What what made you think, or you all, you know, anytime I say you, I'm talking about all of us or none, and I'm talking about the movement itself. What made you think that in in the California capital, they could or would do anything about removing that particular clause. Apparently, and this is something I just learned from looking at the research. Apparently, the California state has a set of laws and regulations to make them in compliance with the Const United States Constitution about this 13th Amendment and so on. What made you think y'all could change that in California? And 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 I guess in addition to that is where is that now? Yeah, um, I think I think for us, uh, I mean, it, it's 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 really the inspiration of, of folks like you, Eddie, and people that, you know, stood against the system. Uh, you know what I mean? You know, our predecessors. And so it only felt right uh, for us to continue the work and the legacy uh, to, to, to really end slavery, knowing that it's not ended. Um, and, and California being, uh, you know, a really influential state, you know, we got the fifth largest economy, um, and we have some of the most people incarcerated, 70% of those being black and brown. And so when you look at the history in California of indigenous slavery and African American slavery, um, it's still very, you know, it, it's the same type of, uh, you know, uh, dynamic going on today inside the prison industrial complex. And so, um, that, that's why, I mean, I think that we didn't even really think about how, how tough it was. It was more like, this is something that needs to be done. Um, and where it's at now is, is, so we introduced resolutions locally and our resolutions weren't, um, uh, really tied to any legislation yet because there wasn't any legislation on the state level. Um, there is now there's ACA three assembly constitutional amendment three, uh, which is in the California legislature. And it's been brought about, um, and, and Sydney Kamlager is is the author of that bill. Uh, she's the um, elected um, assemblywoman, I believe, going to be in the Senate now. And so uh, that bill is is an appropriations committee. It moved forward through public safety. It did pass, but it got stuck in in the suspense file in in the appropriations committee, which means uh, that it got flagged as being too costly. And so we we knew uh, off the bat that you know CDCR and, and the system was gonna was gonna you know oppose the bill for sure, um, and we knew that they were gonna say it was gonna it was gonna cost too much to to pay people a humane wage. And so we're really not trying to get into the whole you know debating about the wages. It's more about um, what's right and what's wrong. You know, it's about being humane, and people should be be treated as human whether they made a mistake, whether they're inside of a prison or an ICE detention facility, because this is also happening in the ICE detention facilities. Um, we know that the system is using th this as a way to to exploit um, and, and to gain free labor like they did, you know, upon colonization, really. And so we we, we have to interrupt that, uh, you know, that dynamic, you know, for the sake of our children and for the future uh, generations. Okay. Okay, John, John, talk a little bit about what you are doing now on the ground to kind of like help this effort. Uh, so now as a um, policy fellow, I've been learning the uh, ins and outs of policy and 
you know, how to how to track a bill, how to support a bill. And uh, we've been doing organizing and just getting the issue raised, like in our communities, because, um, you know, we got to educate our communities just like we were educated. So, you know, we're just uh, raising it, raising the issue. And we got the um, ABC campaign, which is abolishing bondage collectively. And um, also we have the local um, resolutions that we're getting passed. We we have, uh, you know, it's called reject slavery. So like whatever city we're in, Oakland rejects slavery, Sacramento rejects slavery. So, you know, um, Geronimo, he's been a, a big help in this in this fight. And, you know, I'm also learning a lot from him as, you know, as, as my brother. So it's, it's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool situation that I'm in. It's like a dream come true. It's like, I really am able to really just put my foot on the ground and, and get involved, you know, with mm-hmm. people I grew up with and everything. So. Okay. Okay. You said the, the, the resolutions in different cities, I understand Y- y'all, y'all are having a drive in um, in Oakland. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that, uh, Geronimo? Uh, what's happening in Oakland in terms of that resolution and and stuff? Yeah, well, well, to preface it, we we um, like John said, we introduced resolutions all over the state of California in order to just build momentum on the grassroots level. Uh, we introduced one in Riverside, San Diego. Uh, we were able to pass one in San Francisco unanimously, and they did a press conference and such to to uh, support those efforts. Um, and so we moved on from San Francisco and said we need to go to Oakland now. And Oakland being, uh, you know, cornerstone of the movement, really, as far as, you know, the start of the Black Panthers and just so much of the civil rights movement. Uh, we thought that it would be, you know, uh, just a, a, a good experience for us to, to raise Oakland, you know, as, a, as, as that kind of hub of organizing. And so on August 21st, we're going to be honoring, uh, you know, Black August and the uh, organizing of, of, you know, the legendary George Jackson. Um, and we're also going to be lifting up our resolution, Oakland Rejects Slavery, which is in support of, of ACA3 and is in support of denouncing structural racism and vestiges of slavery. Um, and so we're trying to really build a collective of, of abolitionists, people that believe that the system needs to be changed. Um, and not just reformed, that we need to, you know, radically change this thing um, and rebuild it in a way that's more humane and that actually serves the interests of of the people. And California being, you know, so diverse and Oakland itself being real diverse of of Black and Latinos um, and our API community, um, you know, it's just, I feel it's the perfect location. And so we're going to be at Little Bobby Hutton Park um, on August 21st, uh, I believe from like 12 to 430 um, and we're going to be barbecuing. We're going to be having some entertainment. Um, we're going to be having some speakers uh, up there talking about the movement and, and different things that they're involved in on the grassroots level. Um, and we're just going to be, you know, coming together as a community, you know, and, and letting the Oakland community know that uh, there's an organization out here that they could tap in with that that is trying to, you know, end slavery uh, once and for all and not only end slavery, but but abolish the system as it is. Um, and so, you know, I think people are getting energized by that. Uh, we're also going to break bread with people and, and just, you know, spend time with our community as we should. And so uh, with COVID and everything else, it's, it's been a long time coming since people have been able to get together. I think we're all really looking forward to, to the 21st, um, you know, and, you know, honoring, you know, uh, the Attica uprising and just so many things that, that folks sacrificed, uh, you know, behind the wall um, and honoring all of that history on August 21st. And so, um, yeah, if you follow our, our, um, our page, uh, legal services for prisoners with children.org, you'll be able to uh, see kind of the, the flyer and different ways. If you're in the area, uh, you'll be able to come through and, and spend some time with us if you're in California. Um, and if you're not, you know, there's, there's other ways that you can impact, uh, the community. Uh, we're always accepting, you know, donations or just, uh, you, however you want to get involved, you know, um, just, you know, tap in with us on our website um, or, or you could always reach out to me or John or any of us other organizers on the ground. Okay, like John, 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 you know, you say you got out in November and you hit the ground and you actually were lucky because, you know, you you plugged into some positive people and you got a, obviously a great mentor. Um, 
what's happening inside? Is this, I mean, you know, when you came in contact with the older brothers or mentors inside and they shoved some books in your face and told you to learn. And obviously you were in great shape. So they took you to the weight room, you know, so what's happening inside now? Is there a movement of some sort inside that you are in contact with that can, that can help this effort uh, that you are involved in now in terms of their outside family members plugging in? Can you talk a little bit about that? What, what did you leave behind? And if, if nothing, then what should be done? Um, so when I left, I left a lot of good comrades in there and um, I'm still in contact with a, a whole bunch of the fellas and uh, also um, getting them to join all of us or none. We have a all of us or none inside membership also, uh, not just outside. So, you know, we keep them up, up to date. We have a newsletter. We keep them up to date. We, uh, we answer uh, letters. But also personally, I have a, like my brothers are in there. So, you know, they're they're joining the movement too. you know, spreading the word and, and, and trying to spread the knowledge. And it's a big movement. A lot of my friends still in there. A lot of good people, a lot of good men in there, a lot of good women in there, too. OK, OK. Um, Geronimo, just just bounce for a minute and talk about this center, this movement center that y'all just purchased and are developing. Talk about that a little bit. I'm impressed with that. Yeah, well, well, you know, upon getting the, the, the fellowship, you know, I headed to the headquarters in Oakland um, and uh, it's called the Freedom and Movement Center. It's on 4400 Market Street in Oakland. And I was I was blown away, honestly. Uh, when you go in, you see a big banner that says welcome home. Uh, because, you know, Dorsey really prides, uh, Dorsey Nunn, our executive director, prides himself on, you know, welcoming pe people home that, that are inside for a lot of years. And especially um, a lot of our a lot of our elders, you know, a lot of people that have been in there for decades. And so, uh, you know, we create a space that's that's nothing. It's all about community. Um, it's all about, you know, welcoming folks, uh, you know, after a lot of traumatic years, you know what I mean? It, whether in the system or, or you know, incarcerated. And so uh, there we have what's called the ancestor wall, where we basically he has pictures. Uh, we have pictures of just tons of different activists and leaders uh, over the years. Um, it's just it's, it's really uh, uh, it's a sight to see. And so, um, you know, the Freedom and Movement Center is somewhere where I know that I have felt at home from day one. Um, it's somewhere that, you know, uh, you can be yourself. Like John said, we're, we're encouraged to speak in our own voice. Um, and, and, and a lot of times it's, it's a lot of pain, you know what I mean? It's a lot of pain that we go through. And so having a space where, where we can vent and we could talk with each other and we could, you know, really be family and community, um, it, it's, it's integral to the movement. You know what I mean? We really need those type of spaces. And so, um, it, it, it kind of reminds me of when I used to read about the Panthers and the Berets and they would have community centers where folks would come together. Um, it, it's really a throwback in that sense, somewhere where we can all break bread and, and communion. Um, and really just uh, love on each other and support each other and also strategize, right, on, on how we can make things better um, in our community. And so uh, anybody that's, you know, ever in California, I would, I, would, I would say, man, make sure you make a trip out to 4400 Market Street uh, to the Freedom and Movement Center. Um, you know, pay a visit to us. We're going to welcome you with some love, with some food, um, and just, uh, you know, talk community with you, talk movement with you. And so, uh, yeah, it's been a great experience. Um, I think that uh, it, it's really, it's really, uh, it's it's in a great location. Being you know the roots in Oakland, you know what I mean. The roots run really deep, and so uh, that that movement center is is somewhere where you know people can really uh, you know dig them roots in. You know what I mean, and and, and get planted. And so, uh, yeah, uh, the Freedom of Movement Center is is a big part of the work that we do. Okay. Um Final words, John, uh, if, if you had an opportunity to just speak to the public uh, and let them know what that experience does to people, uh, juveniles, uh, adults, men and women, when you throw them in cages like that, 
what would you say that they should take away from that experience? Uh, I would say that um, it's not humane. It's uh, it's really traumatizing. It's not. It's really not humane. It uh, you know, it closes you in, and uh, you know, it, it forces you to be a certain way because you know you're locked in there, like like animals. You know, so if it it kind of forces you to act like that. You know what I'm saying? And then you know, people will judge you based off of the circumstance, you know, are based off of where you've been, but, uh, it's not a humane thing to do. You know, it, it, it just, it's not it. Okay. Got you. Got you. That, that's loud and clear. Uh, Geronimo, you get the final word here. If you want to just speak to the public about your work or what they need to be doing or why they should be doing something, uh, what would you say? Uh, well, we, we got uh, 30, all of us are non-chapters in 16 states, and we're starting to mobilize on the federal level. Um, I would say uh, whatever state that you're in, whatever area you're in, uh, either look up all of us or not. It don't have to be us. You know, look up community orgs that are out there uh, try, trying to liberate, you know, and trying to organize and agitate the system. Um, get involved. You know, uh, I think that you know, so many of us can, can sit on the sidelines and just be on social media, these other things and and not really get active. And so um, I would say get active, um, join ABC, Abolish Bondage Collectively. Um, you know, that's a good way for you to get involved in, in the abolitionist network that we're creating. Um, and, and really, it's not like you're joining and we're going to be telling you, all right, here's the march. And you're going to have a, a chance to really jump in and get involved and, and, and help create. Uh, because that's that's really what we're all about, learning from each other, building community and educating each other. Um, and so that's what I would say is, is people get involved, um, look up legal services for prisoners with children. Um, all of us are none. Like I said, we got chapters all over the nation. Um, and, and let's make sure that, uh, you know, we write these wrongs of the past and that, you know, we abolish slavery uh, once and for all. And once we abolish slavery, you know, I just want to mention that you know, we, we, we amend this part of the Constitution, and that's not the end of the fight. You know, Colorado, Utah, Nebraska, they've already done that. Uh, but that's just the beginning. You know what I mean? Because it's not like the system is going to all of a sudden be paying people $20 an hour to do work. Um, they're going to, they're gonna, uh, you know, struggle against us as well. And so after that is going to be the real fight and making sure that our people inside are organized, um, that, you know, we're, we're going on strikes or we're unionizing, we're doing what we need to do. Um, in order to make sure that we're we're maximizing and capitalizing off that legal uh, right that we have once it's out of the Constitution, um, and so I just want to I want to emphasize that this is barely the beginning. Um, you know, once we amend this Constitution uh, on the on the state level in California, we'll, we'll amend it federally, um, and once we do that, we, it's going to take a big, large organizing effort uh, of our folks to make sure that the system is being held accountable and that people are being treated. Uh, humanely and, and being paid a living wage, uh, because that's only going to help, you know, reduce recidivism. It's only going to uplift our communities. Um, you know, we understand that our mothers and our families take a lot of the toll when we're inside, you know, economically, um, they're, they're supporting us. I mean, they're, they're charging us for, for everything. You just had somebody on here about the phone calls, right? There's, there's companies out here that are capitalizing off of every single aspect, whether it's food, a phone call, a visit, um, and so we want to make sure that we're struggling against that um, and that, you know, we're making sure that our, our next generation don't have to deal with slavery on any level. You know, uh, I said this was the final word, but you said something that made me want to ask you one more question. You said the constitutions uh, were amended in Colorado and a couple of other states are you saying that the, that Second Amendment piece was taken? Talk about that for a minute, because I wasn't aware of that. How many states and what does it mean? So Utah, Nebraska, uh, and Colorado, to my knowledge, I might be missing one, uh, but there's a few states that have, uh, through organizing efforts that we're trying to do, uh, we're able to amend their state constitution to remove uh, the exception clause. And so what that did is that gave people inside, as soon as they 
you know, continued to be exploited, they were able to uh, have legal rights, you know, so whether that's litigation or lawsuits in order to, uh, you know, sue the state and say, hey, hold up, you guys can't pay us, you know, pennies on the dollar anymore. Uh, that is removed, you know, and so we have legal bounds now to fight for our rights. And so that's basically what's been happening in, in Colorado. There's a lot of lawsuits going down with the inmates um, as far as folks, you know, you know, fighting for the rights, fighting for the right to be paid, uh, you know, some kind of some kind of wage, you know. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're pushing that line here in California as well. Article one, section six is where that exception lies. And so we want to make sure once we amend that, that people inside know their rights. Right. Because a lot of them are just going to continue to work, continue to be pushed into these systems, not knowing any better. And so we, it's, our, it's on us to make sure that our folks inside are educated and understand that, hold on now, the Constitution removed the exception. So now you have to you have the right to demand um, a fair wage. And so that's going to take a whole nother uh, phase of organizing and educating. Um, and so we're just excited to be part of this this entire process. Um, and California, man, it's, it's, it's really it's, it's a huge uh, like I said earlier, it's an influential state in the nation. And so I really, really strongly feel that if we're able to amend the Constitution here, um, it's going to have large repercussions across the nation. Um, and so the amount of money that's made off of uh, exploited labor uh, here in California is exponential. And so once we attack that uh, part of the prison industrial complex, that's going to be a cornerstone that, that falls. And hopefully we can continue to just, you know, rip away at the system um, and rebuild it like I said earlier, rebuild it in a more humane way, in a way that all of us are treated humanely. Um, and, you know, and, and we talk about love and rest restoration and redemption um, instead of just, you know, punitive laws that keep us in cells, uh, keep us in cages. So. Okay, that was the last word. John, Geronimo, thanks for joining me. It's an honor, Thank Mr. You. Conway. And uh, like I said earlier, it's an honor to be with you. Okay. All right. And thank you for joining this episode of Rattling the Bars.